beautiful people. Welcome to The Brief and thank you for watching. I am your host, Carrie Elleveld. Marcos is out today doing something amazing. We always hope that when people are out. So uh, I'll be co-hosting with one of my favorite partners in crime, Kara Zelaya. And if you were here last time when we co-hosted together, you'll know on the student debt episode, uh, things can get a little dicey when we're co-hosting. So, you know, I mean, we went for like a, a full minute 30 over our time. And I think, I don't know, it just kind of blew the whole thing out of the water, huh, Kara? Yeah, I mean, it, it, quite, it was quite the stir. Our editor had to edit down some minutes, seconds, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to start with a look at whether there's hope for reforming our nation's gun laws in the wake of several, several recent mass shootings. Um, and I believe there is, even though congressional lawmakers have completely failed us on this count for a couple decades now. Um, so there's hope there, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and later we'll dig into what the heck is going on with corporate America and GOP corporatists like Mitch McConnell declaring war on American businesses like he did today. Um, so basically saying, you know, they better shut their traps on these voter suppression laws or there's going to be consequences. I mean, like that that basically came out of Mitch McConnell's mouth today. What? I what? never thought I'd see the day. <laughs> Mitch McConnell. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, um, I haven't even quite pro that that second segment could be a little bit of a hot mess because I haven't even had a, a, a chance to process what an epic paradigm shift this is. Yeah. Um, but we're going to get into that. But first, before we do that, Let's talk a bit. We've had several high profile mass shootings, Kara, and um, in the course of just three weeks, leaving 22 people dead um, from shootings in a Southern California office building, a Colorado supermarket, um, Asian spas in the metro Atlanta area. These are all horrific on their own counts, but it's a misconception to say that gun violence subsided during the pandemic, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Washington Post actually had a really uh, thorough article about this, about how uh, shootings never stopped during the pandemic. And in fact, they cite that 2020 was the deadliest gun violence year in decades. I, I think a lot of people uh, think about gun violence as something that is only these extremely high profile cases that we see, like in the case of Colorado, but uh, gun violence happens constantly. <laughs> it is unfortunately due to our massively under-regulated uh, gun lobby, to be honest, and the influence that they have on Congress. Um, and also these stats, um, and I'm going to put in a little dr trigger warning here, does not take into consideration people who take their own lives with guns, which is also a massive problem when it comes to the mass use of guns in households and in America as, as a culture, unfortunately. So we still are seeing a lot of gun violence and people losing their lives to guns. It just was such, you know, it, it's sad to say that it's such a sad state of affairs that with the pandemic last year and then Trump's incessant <laughs> being Trump uh, and an election year going on uh, and the economic turmoil with it, it wasn't even getting I wouldn't even say above the fold. It was barely it was getting wildly underreported. But the stats tell a very different story. It's it's wild to think that that gun violence was up more yep. last year than it had been in recent years in a while. And yes. and we and we I, I don't remember hardly ever seeing that story. I mean, yeah. it's just crazy to think that. And which shows you a little bit, you know, when you're someone like Trump and you're just spewing stuff all the time, how you can really dominate the news cycle, even if the stuff you're saying is just pure trash and lies and, you know, whatever. It still consumed America, even yeah. while gun violence was just proliferating. And so. also one of the major stories of last year was George Floyd. And, you know, it was our, our next upwing of the, of the civil rights movement, really, I believe. And that people tend to just sort of correlate gun violence as like this lone shooter uh, going to a supermarket. But police is also uh, are deeply involved in gun violence and in how we 
in the, as a country, weaponize the way that we do law and order um, right. to a deadly degree. So everything from police brutality to domestic violence to mental health is deeply entrenched in gun violence, and it needs to be discussed uh, as such, not as just these one-off events that everyone thinks are... Honestly, no one thinks they're rare anymore, but everyone thinks as something unique when it's constantly happening in our cities and all right. over the country. Right. So let's let's bring in our guests here um, for this segment. Uh, joining us to today will be uh, Joe Sudbay and Brandon Wolf. Uh, Joe Sudbay is a good buddy of mine, an amazing all around progressive activist um, on LGBTQ issues, on immigration, but who also worked at Handgun Control Inc. in the 90s when Congress was still capable of passing gun reform laws. Um, he also has, he co-hosts or he hosts regularly on Sirius XM. So you may see him or have heard him there. Um, and during the fall, he does a special segment for, uh, for Sirius XM called State of the State. So welcome, Joe. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be with you. Absolutely. And just so you know, Joe and I, I mean, we worked together really hard on LGBTQ issues during the Obama administration. So if you sense a natural pour there, there's like not a thing we haven't discussed. <laughs> you know, we have some scars from those days. We had a few situations that we ran into, a few people pissed off at us, but all in the, in the end, it all worked out. Right. And I and I benefited greatly from Joe's insights um, into how activism works based on, the you know, a lot of the things that he did um, during, you know, on, on gun control activism in the 90s. Uh, and so that was really helpful to me uh, when I was in Washington. So and also uh, we have Brandon Wolf, who is a survivor of the Pulse nightclub shooting in 2016 in Orlando, Florida, and is now an advocate for gun safety um, and LGBTQ, L LGBTQ rights. Thank you for joining us, Brandon. Thank you. <clears throat> it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And uh, I just, I feel really humbled and honored to be sharing space with people who are so deeply entrenched in making the world a better place. We all try. We all try. Everyone's doing their part <laughs> We're here. We're doing so. our part, our little part. Yep. That's right. So Joe, let's start with you. You know, there's been this common misconception specifically uh, in DC, you know, among the, cons the democratic consultant class um, for the better part of two decades that gun control is a losing issue for Democrats. And that's really just never been true, has it? No, it is. It is such a myth. It's conventional wisdom. And there's like, I think conventional wisdom is one of the, is one of the hardest things to deal with in DC. Things just become believed and repeated. You know and, and can, can I stop you just there? We're getting a little bit of a crackling from your um, from, from your audio. And I'm wondering if maybe we can move to asking a question of Brandon. Sure. Um, and then and then maybe you and uh, Walter, our, our producer, can can just because I don't want people to miss what you're saying. Sure, so sure, sure, sure. I let's get to Brandon real quick. Brandon, um, Kara, I know you had some things that you were interested specifically in asking Brandon. Yeah, uh, Brandon, uh, as we talked off camera, I'm from the Orlando area. I went to UCF and, you know, I, I was I had graduated in 2013. So I had a lot of friends in the area when Pulse happened. Um, it was it was a tragedy of such immense levels that I'm so thankful for you to to be here and, and telling us your story. And Thank I really you. wanted to hear from you about what you've found when it comes to changing people's minds on the issue, the turning tragedy into advocacy, and what what has moved people's hearts and minds that you found with your personal story? Yeah, I appreciate the question. And, and thank you for, for setting it up in that way, because Pulse, I think, touched a lot of people, uh, specifically people who are in the LGBTQ community, because Pulse was about so much more than just a nightclub. It was about so much more than just a Saturday night. Pulse was the kind of safe space that marginalized populations are forced to carve out for ourselves because the spaces that other people uh, can exist in safely are not safe for us. So I think a lot of people felt um, 
they felt like their own safe space had been attacked mm -hmm. uh, on, on the night of June 12th, 2016. And I appreciate the question about how do you move hearts and minds, because I think that's a very critical role that survivors and family members, people who've been personally impacted by gun violence play in how we shift the national narrative. You know, for a really long time, the, the conservative right wing, along with the gun lobby and the NRA, people who stood to amass political power and wealth by sort of pushing these false narratives around guns, they ran the conversation. They allowed them, we allowed them to, to sort of push us to the outsides where we couldn't find any agreement. Uh, we allowed them to sort of boil things down to, to numbers and the Second Amendment and remove the, the human element, the human impact of gun violence. Um, so I really think that there have been two ways that I've been able to impact people. And I think about that in terms of how I've communicated with my own dad, who totally disagrees with me on issues of gun safety. Number one is about humanizing the issue. So my best friends, Drew and Juan, took 19 bullet wounds on the night of Pulse. Uh, one died on the floor of the club, the other didn't make it through surgery. And I think what's been really important in my journey has been to not just tell that part of their story, but to talk about how they lived and the impact that they had on my life so that when you get to the actual pulse part, you understand what a huge hole they left behind. Mm -hmm. And then you start to extrapolate that to say, that was everybody that lost their lives at Pulse. That's every single one of the nearly 35,000 people who lose their lives to gun violence every year in this country. They're not just numbers or, or random names, they're you know empty seats at dinner tables, they're missing faces at birthday parties. And the second really big component I would say has been my um, ability to find common ground, right? And meet people where they are. Again, I talked about my dad. We agree on almost nothing politically, okay? If that tells you where we are, um, but, we find that when we're able to, to sort of cut through the things that people tell us we're supposed to believe, that there is some common ground on how we keep people safe. We agree that if he took a background check, so should our neighbor have to take a background check. We agree that if we know the guy down the street to be a danger to himself and his family, to have a history of domestic violence, that someone should be able to petition a court to remove those firearms from the home. We agree on those things. So we practice a little thing where We'll be in a conversation and I'll say, okay, we're gonna parking lot the one or two things that are, are that we just will never agree on. And we're gonna meet each other where we know we agree. And that is that we wanna keep people safer. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me let me just jump in here real quick. You know, I, I saw a clip of you on MSNBC with Joy Reid. And uh, one, of, one of the things she asked was, how is it possible that we're still in a place of non-movement in Congress following these, these recent mass shootings when the NRA is unraveling before our very eyes? And I liked your response to that. Can you give us your viewpoint of what's motivating GOP lawmakers to continue to be against gun control laws, even though the NRA isn't going to probably be a huge factor, or at least not the factor they've been, um, in recent election cycles? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's sort of racking everyone's brain, right? Because how is it possible that we have been waging this battle against the NRA and its sort of propaganda machine for decades? And we seemingly have won that battle in the short term, right? They're, they filed for bankruptcy. They're looking to pick up shop and move to Texas where it's maybe a little friendlier for them. They're certainly on the defensive and, and riddled with fraud. So the question is, okay, if the NRA is moving toward being a defunct organization, how is it still so hard to make progress on issues of gun safety? And I think the answer is that the NRA has only ever been one small component of the problem. If you look at Republican politics today, they essentially function as an own the libs operation. There is no sort of, you know, political legislative agenda. There is no good faith discussion about tax policy or, or how we move the country toward progress together. Gone are the days of the, I'm doing air quotes, uh, compassionate conservatism of George W. Bush, however not compassionate that was. Um, those days are really gone and, and we're in an era where the Republican party doesn't see any political risk to not doing anything on these issues. Rather they see their base and their ability to amass and retain power as sort of steeped in being as 
outrageous, extravagant, as contrarian, as, um, as obstructive as possible, their only role in their minds is to obstruct progress. And when they do that, they can sell it to their base, they can sell it to base voters, and they will come home to roost in election cycles. We're watching that not just on gun safety, we're watching it on LGBTQ issues as anti-trans bills sweep the country. We're watching it on immigration. Remember, this is a party that you know, 20 years ago was talking about a path to citizenship for immigrants. And now we're looking at a party that is, you know, inherently xenophobic to its core. So I think it's it goes far beyond the NRA. And it's more about the political DNA of the current Republican Party, and just how far off the reservation they've gone in order to be the best Twitter troll and, and search for right. that next viral tweet. Right. Gre grievance politics on steroids, right? And so this is a good time to just ask, uh, Joe Sudbay, who's joined us, uh, joined back with us here um, about a little bit about the history of of gun control and and the fact that this this really was never a losing issue for Democrats. And it certainly isn't now. No, you know, so often I will hear people or read people and they'll say, oh, well, back in the 90s, things were really changed. Well, back in the 90s, Bill Clinton was leaning in on guns. Bill Clinton got the Brady Law passed. Bill Clinton got the assault weapons ban passed in 1994, which passed, I want to point out, without dealing with a filibuster. That's how much the filibuster has changed, that the NRA couldn't even get Republicans or any of their supporters to filibuster gun laws back in the 80s and 90s, just as an, uh, an aside. But right, um, so those were so those were passing the a lot of these gun measures passed with simple majorities. Assault absolutely. weapons ban passed with a simple majority. Um, some some uh, uh, handgun the, control laws uh, in particular. Yeah, the back, yeah. The Brady background check and the Brady Brady law was supported by about over 90% of the American people. The assault weapon ban had strong support. In, in 1996, you know, this is when, when people say to me, oh, but you know, guns were such a scary issue. In 1996, at the Democratic convention on the first night, Bill Clinton invited James and Sarah Brady to speak. Now, I worked with them. Uh, for those who don't know, it's kind of ancient history in many ways. Jim Brady was Ronald Reagan's press secretary who was shot and, um, and he and his wife, Sarah, became advocates for gun violence prevention. And so they were on the first night of the convention. You don't highlight an issue like that at your convention, if you think it's a, a dangerous issue, that same year we passed an amend, we passed legislation to prevent domestic violence um, convictions for misdemeanors from being uh, able to purchase or possess firearms. In the Senate, that passed 97 to two. So it, Brandon mentioned how much the Republican Party has changed on. Um, immigration. Back in the 90s, when I, I did state legislation and we were fighting the NRA's efforts to allow people to carry handguns in public wherever they wanted to. Some of our best allies during that fight were Republican governors in Illinois, Kansas, Ohio, California, New Jersey. You know, they wanted to be on the right side of that issue and they didn't think it was a good idea. So a lot of things changed after Al Gore lost in 2000. A lot of people said Al Gore lost because of guns. He didn't. That same year. Let, let's I, just be clear that the people who were saying that were the people inside the beltway, right? I, I don't think beltway. that was nest. Yeah. I don't think that was necessarily a, a, a across America thing. No, that was democratic consultants inside the beltway deciding that that issue had hurt uh, Al Gore when in fact it, it clearly, it clearly wasn't you know, I mean, it was just a complete misconception. Sorry. It was a complete misconception. But that kind of dogma that happens, that conventional wisdom, really shut the issue down. And I'll give you one example since we have two Floridians on the phone. In 1998, we did a referendum on gun shows to allow background checks at gun shows in Florida. It passed with 72% of the vote. The NRA outspent us probably 10 to 1. In the 2000 Senate race, Bill Nelson, who... Um, is now going to be the head of NASA and was a senator. That was his first run for Senate. He leaned in on the gun issue so heavily against Bill McCollum, who had, was then the Republican chair of the House Judiciary Committee. We did an independent expenditure. After the election, Bill Nelson did a call with some of our donors and said, I won because of the gun issue. So Bill Nelson won comfortably in 2000 in Florida uh, because he talked about the gun issue. 
Al Gore refused to discuss it, which is a whole other subject. And Carrie knows I go off on that too often. <laughs> we can I, spend a, we can spend an hour on that, but no, no, we probably I'm, won't. <laughs> I'm not rational about it, but I have written about it. But um, but and didn't talk about the gun issue, and he lost. I mean, maybe he didn't really lose, but still, the, the, you know, the gun issue is a winning issue when you lean into it and you own it and you talk about it because people support background checks. People support the assault weapon ban. Voters overwhelmingly, particularly swingier voters. And when you don't talk about it, you are letting the NRA mystique continue. And you are letting Republicans who aren't in step with the vast majority of their constituents get away with not having to address an issue that shows how extreme they are. Yeah. And let's just say that the Democratic members of the House and Senate are talking about it. Yes. And it's, it's really clear to me that the politics have changed on this. Um, it's been clear for a while. But but, you know, just recently, for instance, uh, Congresswoman Abigail Sp Spanberger, who is in a very swingy district in Virginia, who has had two pretty tight election races um, and just, you know, kind of squeaked by in 2020. Um, she just recently, after these uh, a couple of these mass shootings, wrote, you know, put out a tweet trying to pressure uh, Senate Democrats in particular to take it up, and and also, I mean, I think just the Senate, but but um, to say, you know, the the American people expect action on the two bills that the House has already passed. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, this is, this is um, you know, she she is in the swingiest of districts and there's no way that N Nancy Pelosi as speaker would be putting her, um, you know, people in tight races on the line in 2022, which is going to be a squeaker for Democrats anyways. Yep. Yeah. You know, if sorry and sorry to cut in here, but I, I think it's important to note, you know, a lot of what Joe was talking about in terms of of Democrats running on guns in the 90s and early 2000s and being successful and, and what you've brought up with Representative Spanberger, I have a really personal experience with that. And that is that my Congresswoman, Stephanie Murphy, ran in 2016, the year that Donald Trump ascended to the presidency. Uh, she ran against a guy here in Central Florida in the downtown Winter Park area who had been in Congress for decades. That, that seat had been controlled by Republicans for over 20 years. And she jumped into the race after the shooting at Pulse because her opponent, who was her congressman at the time, took a check from the NRA two days after 49 mostly LGBTQ people were murdered in a club in his district. So she announced her race and she said, I'm going to run on gun safety. She won that race. She flipped that seat for the first time in decades. She's now the chair of the Blue Dog Democratic Caucus. And oh, by the way, she's still a leading voice on gun safety in Congress. She's the one who ushered funding for gun violence prevention research over the finish line. She's the one who led the successful charge to to get rid of the um, to get rid of the amendment that that doesn't allow Congress to spend money on gun violence prevention research. So these things are happening right now, and I think it goes to the core of what you were asking about the NRA, and that is that we're at sort of this uh, critical mass in the United States where so many people, so many communities have impact have been impacted by gun violence that to believe that nothing should change is to be in total conflict with where the American populace is. We are at a place where running as a Democrat on gun safety means you're probably with the rest of the country at the very same time that the Republican Party has seemingly decided to exist for no other reason than to oppose whatever the Democrats are running on. Such a good point. I just want to follow up a little bit. Um, Carrie, you mentioned um, Abigail Spanberger in Virginia. And I think, you know, this past election was kind of hard to break through anything, the, the federal election, right? But a good example of when Democrats lean into issues in recent times has been in Virginia. Virginia doesn't just have, you know, off-season elections. They have off-off-season elections, right? Which no election should ever be off-season. But you know what I mean? Like, they had an election in 2017 where Democrats retook control of the House of Delegates. And they ran as progressives. They ran on the gun issue. They were very clear. In 2019, the Democrats took control of the Senate. And you mentioned the show I do, State of the States. I was able to interview candidates for state Senate and state um, delegate races in Virginia. And like Gazala 
Ghazala Hashmi told me, she's in the Richmond area. I said, what's the number one issue that people want to talk about? She said, it's guns, it's gun violence. That it was coming up in state legislative races. And the thing about uh, the state races is, you know, there's usually not a, a lot else happening. So you can actually dig into real issues that people, that people's matter to people's lives. It didn't get caught up in, you know, for, those were the pre-pandemic days. But I think it's a really good example of elections where, you know, and then the Democrats took control of the House and the Senate, and they've passed really good legislation. Kara, it looked like you were you were on board with that. What do you got over there? She's, she's yeah. just champing at the bit. I'm just, I mean, honestly, it's like I'm at church. Y'all are just like preaching and I'm out here, you know, having to mute my microphone. But I, I really just want to jump in and say that I think right now uh, with what we've seen of the popularity of the COVID relief bill, it is a really telling time in which Republicans on the Hill are telling us that something isn't popular, but the American public is telling us that something is resoundingly popular. Just because something isn't Mitch McConnell Donald's idea or what he would right. prefer doesn't mean that it is not bipartisan. And that's such an important distinction to make right now in this moment that we're in in 2021. And I wanted to bring in I on the brief, I, I have a reputation of coming in and talking about the youth vote. And you know, this is extremely important to young voters. Gun violence is a huge issue. I was born in 1990. Uh, Columbine happened when I was 11. I have grown up with gun violence in this country. I've not known a single year since I was young in which there wasn't a massive gun violence story in the media and that I didn't have to learn how to prepare myself in my classrooms in high school and in college. Like that's what we grew up with. Um, the students at Parkland have done an excellent job with March for Our Lives in which they've registered thousands and thousands of young people to vote. And so if we are trying to build a coalition of progressives, of Democrats, we have to be champions for their issues. And gun violence prevention is a huge issue that young people are really rallying behind. So, you know, it doesn't matter what Mitch McConnell's saying on the Hill, really. What, what the American people want is resoundingly clear and also universal background checks are incredibly popular incredible one of the most popular issues in this country getting widespread support from all side all, all demographics and all political point of views much like brandon said in, in talking with uh his father about the issue so I think that it's time to be bold and to be unafraid and to continue to win elections through things that are common sense reform at minimum Absolutely. So let me let me let me wrap up this discussion real quick. I'm going to throw a question to Joe. I'm going to ask Brandon for his final thoughts. Um, and uh, but, you know, we're looking at can this can the Senate do this? The House has already passed some bills. Now, they may not those bills in their current form, um, those two bills right now. Uh, may not may not work in the Senate, but something can work in the Senate, or at least I think so. Um, and I wonder. So you know, as as Kara points out, background checks incredibly incredibly popular, and yet failed after that horrific shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. I mean, I think you know people were just distraught that we couldn't get a bipartisan background check bill through. Um, that was co-sponsored by Senators Joe Manchin, a Democrat, and uh, Pat Toomey, uh, a Republican. So, so Joe, what do you think the prospects are if the filibuster ends up being reformed by Democrats? I mean, I don't think we're going anywhere without the filibuster getting reformed, but I'm still hopeful there's a possibility that the filibuster will get reformed. Um, and if that happens, where are we on some potential count on a on a gun law? Well, first of all, I, I absolutely agree. It's all about the filibuster. And keeping and not dealing with the filibuster is playing Mitch McConnell's game. Cara was talking about that. You know, we, we have to change the rules. You just have to. And I want to point out, again, I mentioned this, but the federal, the Brady law passed without a filibuster. The assault weapon ban, its first manifestation in, this, in November of 1993, passed without an, uh, a filibuster. The gun show loophole passed in the Senate in 1999, 51-50. We were able to do a renewal of the assault weapon ban in 2004 without a filibuster. The background check bill you mentioned failed because of the filibuster. It was after Mitch McConnell had changed the rules. There was a time you could do these things because the American people wanted them. And I actually believe very strongly that 
if we end the filibuster, there would be more bipartisanship. You would see more Republican senators come to the table. And several of them have voted in the past for background check laws. They voted for um, Manchin Toomey in 2013. And, you know, it, 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 changing the filibuster is important for everything, starting with voting rights, but every single other thing that impacts our, our lives. And Democrats are going to have to decide whether they're going to stick with the Jim Crow relic or do what? 90% of the American people want, like, enough, the American people don't, 90% of the American people don't support anything. That is like the best national consensus you could ever have. Right. And Democrats need, in the Senate, need to just take the step and do it. They will make America very happy. Brandon, I, I want to give you the, the final thought here, um, because we so appreciate your perspective, your personal perspective on this. Yeah, well, thank you again for having me. And and I think what what's important to keep in mind, because we get sort of in the weeds on these conversations, and I love the weeds. I, I could talk <laughs> about the filibuster all day long, which is really not where I thought I would be five years ago when I was working for Starbucks and did not think I would ever enter this life. But here I am, passionate about the filibuster. Um, but I also think it's really important that we not lose sight of why we get into the weeds, why we're so passionate about reforming the filibuster, why we're so passionate about the unity behind gun safety legislation. And that is because people's lives are on the line. I did the most ordinary thing on June 12th of 2016. I was at a club with my best friends, a club we'd been at a hundred times, a club I could navigate with my eyes closed. And all I did was step into the bathroom to wash my hands and it saved my life. Before I knew it, I was outside underneath the stars with gunfire blaring in the background, this smell of blood and smoke burning my nose. And I knew that my best friends were never going to make it out of there alive. That's the real human cost of gun violence. I looked at their autopsy reports and looked at 19 gunshot wounds between the two of them. Drew's the consistent with someone who was protecting someone else, which I knew had to be true on the floor of that club. That's the real human cost of gun violence. His mother spends every holiday alone because she's not married and he was her only child. That's the real human cost of gun violence. And every time we get into the weeds and, and we talk about filibuster and we talk about whether or not reforms are worth it, we have to remember that people's actual lives are on the line every single day. People send their kids off to school and bring them home in a casket. People send their husband, their brother, their family member off to work and bring them home in a body bag. That cannot be acceptable in America. We have to do what it takes to change the rules and we can't lose sight of the human cost while we do it. I, all I can say to that is amen, brother. I completely agree. Um, I, I am going to thank you for being with us today, giving your personal perspective. Joe Sudbay is going to stick around for now, but thank you very much, Brandon, for joining us. We so appreciate your, your insights. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks, Brandon. Wow. I mean, I just have to say, when he said I stepped into the bathroom and that saved my life, just chill, a chill went down my spine. So I'm going to recover here for a second. Yeah, it I, off, I have but. to tell you, I, you know, I've worked with gun violence families and survivors for so long and I'm I'm I it's gutting and I you know and, and pulse I, I've told you before Carrie is just the one it just I get emotional all the time and uh, I, I'm just so in awe of Brandon's courage and his message and he's right it is about people and um it, you know, I we meet the most amazing people for the worst reasons, yeah. and um, and uh, just just I am so in awe of him and so many others. Yeah, it's uh, you know, uh, Florida particularly has been uh, in the center of these kind of things. With um, I'm from Broward County, so when you talk about 2000 politics, uh, I remember it, and uh, I went to school in Orlando, so I remember Pulse. It was all like you know, one degree of separation type of thing, yeah. um, and. Uh, every time I've met with activists or work with them, it's always like the the best people in the absolute worst club on earth, yeah. you know, yeah. and they are doing the work. And not only are they doing the work and bringing their emotional stories in, 
uh, as we saw with Brandon, they are unbelievably quick, unbelievably polished. They know the issue backwards and forwards. They can talk to you about the filibuster. They can talk to you about who we need to petition, who their local representatives are, and talk about the fact that at the end of the day, it is the human issue. So, um, yeah. Can I just say one thing? I know we want to go on, but you know, um, Car, you mentioned the Parkland students, and I want to say one thing about them. They changed the political conversation because what used to happen when there was a shooting, I mean, it's the weirdest, most bizarre American ritual. We all knew our roles after a shooting. The media knew their roles. It, it, It just became a thing. And the NRA would always not comment and they'd discourage people from commenting and you can't talk about it and you were maligned. And those kids came out after that and they said, screw that. And they said it more forcefully, screw that. This is our lives. This is a political issue. We're not gonna shut up. And it changed the way we talk about the wake of mass shootings and shootings in general. And I give them all the credit in the world because they did that. They did it because they weren't playing the game the same way. And we really needed to be a sh- to, to shake up the way that happened. And I am in awe of them. Yeah. To- and I'm going to create totally a bridge agree. into our, our next issue, too, because um, one of the genius uh, <laughs> things about those students is that they also started uh, protesting Publix, which is a major grocery store in Florida. Yeah. Um, they started going after corporations. They started organizing things, like I said, from the totally wonky level of it. Um, but also, you know, it cannot be stated enough the role that the NRA used to play and the role that it continues to play, but it shouldn't because it has proven over and over again to just be the most failing, horrible, corrupt corporation or group that has existed in our American politics. Um, So Carrie, I I tried there with that bridge. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let me let me offer this. As long as we're talking about paradigm shifts. Yes. Let's talk about the GOP going to war on corporate America. What? What? I know, I know. I have a high pitched voice when I get super excited. You know, you're just yeah. gonna have to. Li- I, I'm sorry to our our listeners, our viewers might get past it, but um, this is just bizarre. Let's first of all bring in uh, our next guest to join us, um, and his name is Zach Mueller. Uh, he's director of communications for Immigration Equality. Uh, and has watched nearly every vicious, hateful GOP ad of the 2020 election cycle and a lot of the 2018 election cycle too. Um, And I'm just gonna, so first of all, Zach, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here, thanks thanks for having me. Uh, Okay, great. And second of all, yeah, go ahead. uh, Zach's with America's Voice, Immigration Did I not say that? My bad. Yeah, is the amazing group that does a lot of work for LGBT immigrants. So I just want. Oh to- yeah, no, no, no. You're right. I, 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 I wrote it down wrong. Anyway, I knew that, but I got it wrong. So I'm glad for the correction. America's Voice. Thank you so much. Um, that you, I appreciate that. I actually used to work some with uh, immigration equality, so it just great. like float off. Um, anyway, so good correction. So, so that is the beginning of what could be a hot mess of a segment, because this is a bizarro thing that has just happened in the um, in the past, like I don't know, three days or something. Um, and I'm going to bring Zach in in a second to talk about a, a, a series of ads, an ad montage that he put together for us. But first, let's just let's just take a second. Over the weekend, Georgia Republicans declared war on Major League Baseball after it pulled the, its all-star game from the state over its new voter suppression law, which of course Republicans passed, right? So Republicans are draining the state of revenues um, and at the same time say, making war on the Major League Baseball. Then this week, hold on, that's not enough. It's not enough to go after baseball, hot dogs, and apple pie. This week, Mitch McConnell threatened corporations. And he's saying, let's see if I have this exact quote. Do I have it here? Oh, boy. I might not have it. Oh, here it is. Sorry. (laughs) He says, today, my warning to corporate America, this is Mitch McConnell, just to be clear. My warning to corporate America is to stay out of politics. Okay, so he's he's warning them with consequences. And then he says, oh, oh, also, 
I'm not talking about political contributions. <laughs> what? It's so what? pathetic. It's, it's, so, it's pathetic. so pathetic. It's pathetic. You know, basically, basically, shut your freaking traps and just give us the money. Show us the money. I yeah. mean, Joe, can you just say what 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 is happening here? I mean, this is we've got we've got two separate issues, right? We've got this voter suppression law in Georgia that has caused a lot of backlash already from from certain corporations and particularly from the Major League Baseball, um, which has taken a, a huge stand on it. But but then we've got this McConnell thing happening too, which is kind of like corporations writ large, just stay in your lane and your lane is giving us money. So anyway, yeah. go ahead, Joe, what, explain this to, to, to me. Well, first of all, it just shows how reliant Republicans are for corporate donors, right? I mean, in the last couple of cycles, we've seen that Democrats have really unleashed a, a grassroots army. And it's something that folks at Daily Coast were incredibly important in making sure happened, right? And and it showed you don't need those big dollars, right, to, to run. But Mitch McConnell relies on them. And I think there's actually an arc to this that I, I've been thinking about. What the Republicans, what has happened is they've gone so far on their voter suppression. And we had all these corporations that were talking that have talked about civil rights and, you know, ending police violence and all these other, and a lot of other issues they do it on LGBT equality. And it turns out uh, they're paying to elect people who are in direct opposition to that. And it's really been exposed. Judd Legum at Pop popular.info has done a great job of exposing this. And it's really interesting because what the Republicans plan seems to be, we talked about it, they have no agenda. They have no real agenda, right? They have no ideas, nothing. What they want to do is they want to suppress the vote to make sure there's a smaller electorate. Then what they do is they take these corporate dollars, and this is something Zach and I have both spent too much time watching, and I know your colleagues at Daily Coast Elections have the same thing. When you watch their ads, and you see what corporate America is paying for. I have, an, I have to think most corporate CEOs would not want their logos attached to it. You would not believe the racist, xenophobic, homophobic, transphobic crap that Republican campaigns run. Look, politics is, is, a, is a tough business, right? But Republicans the past few cycles, it, it's starting in the Trump era more than ever. I watched the, all the ads in 2018 made me crazy. You would not believe the ugliness. Actually, it started in 2017 well, in Virginia. Um, let's and, go ahead. Go let's ahead. go ahead on the on the not believe note. And Zach compiled a, a quick montage for us of some of these ads. And I'm wondering if our producer, Walter, can go ahead and 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 uh, cue that up for us. MS-13, violent gang members. They exploit immigration loopholes and commit vicious crimes in the U.S. China cheated us on trade and sent us the Wuhan flu. Illegal immigrants took our jobs, spread crime, and sent taxpayers the bill. Nam is so tough, he voted to protect illegal immigrant gang members. And even backed giving illegal immigrants $1,200. Bill Clifford supported spending tax dollars to provide college educations to illegals. And he voted to bring Somali immigrants to western Kansas, even though Somalia is a terrorist hotbed. Portland, New York, San Francisco, sanctuary cities defy federal law and give safe harbor to illegal immigrant criminals. Amnesty for illegal immigrants. Greenfield is so weak on illegal immigration, she even refused to say that crossing the border illegally should be a crime. But here's where Mark Kelly wants to send that money. Here's what Raphael Warnock is calling relief. Sending stimulus checks to illegal immigrants and violent criminals. Funding sanctuary cities. Yeah, so you can see, I mean, and this is, this was pervasive. We're not talking about just a few ads. Zach, will you, will you just take us into a little bit of that and, and what kind of money we're talking about here? Yeah, so as you were saying, like this is a pervasive issue. It it, did, it didn't take me any time at all to to call together uh, those ads, right? And th and those are just specifically the ones that are really using you know xenophobic dog whistles. Like there was more that were you know talking um, uh, about you know um, linking all of the COVID to to China and really a lot of a really aggressive uh, dog whistle racism there as well. Um, a lot of uh, kind of 
stereotypical dog whistle racism around kind of the defunding the police and kind of making it out to be a, a dystopian nightmare of what was happening in the streets around the protests. Um, and so up and down the ticket from the Trump campaign down to low level um, you know, state house races, uh, folks were running on this issue, running on strategic racism as their as their main driver pushing forward. And what we've seen is that, you know, 2020 was the most money that was ever being spent in an election cycle, doubling the, the amount that was in 2016. And on the Republican side, most of that money was going to add, we're using this kind of strategic racism to divide voters along, you know, racist and bigoted lines in order to distract from their failures, like we were saying in the previous segment, that they, they're really kind of a post-policy, you know, party. They don't really have any solutions that are going to help folks, you know, with education or healthcare or getting, you know, good jobs or good wages. They're not proposing any of those sorts of things. You know, they're not even really talking about even about tax cuts anymore, right? They're they're really just kind of using this racial grievance, these bigoted policies, in a, in a hopes to kind of drive fear um, to get folks to to the ballot box. Right. I would love to ask Joe on, on that note, you know, what is the, uh, and also I'll just open it too, but Joe, like, what is the long-term strategy here? <laughs> if that's what we're going, if that's what the Republican strategy is this at this point, which is just kind of xenophobic racism and, and hatred, how is that sustainable? Do they really think that there is still this mass appeal that they can replicate this um, like they did with, with Donald Trump? Well, you know, I think, Carl, that's where the voter suppression kicks in too, right? You need a smaller electorate, you need a smaller, wider, older conservative electorate who will, who these ads may appeal to, right? And, and, and it's being funded, as we said, by corporate America. And look, they're already starting it. This I, We had the stunt um, a couple of weeks ago where Ted Cruz went down to the border and drove on the gunboat with Lindsey Graham. And this week, uh, Steve Scalise has taken a group, they're doing the same thing. They're going to have a press event in a park in um, McAllen, Texas. And if you look on the map, it's called Andalozu Park. I always have, have the worst Spanish speaker in the world. Even my husband is fluent. <laughs> no, no, I'm but, sure it's, I'm sure mine is worse. <laughs> but we, anyway. we, you know, if you do a Google search on the, on that park where they're going to show us how dangerous things are across the river is the Reynosa Zoo, right? I mean, like it's absurd, but we've already seen it. You know, um, a couple of the clips in that piece that uh, uh, Zach showed were from this year, the NRSC attacking Mark Kelly and Reverend Warnock, right? Well, I look at the FEC reports to see who's paying for that. Who's paying for that? And T-Mobile, guess what? T-Mobile is paying for that. You gave them $15,000. We should put your logo on that ad too. And I really right. feel like this year, we have to be much more aggressive as corporate America is thinking about this. Like I want, and we're going to, we're going to work on this this year. Zach and I are obsessed with it. Like yeah. the CEO of T-Mobile, do you realize that you are paying for this because you are, and um, they're already running as Zach knows, um, and he can talk more about it, Facebook ads and everything else, but they run these ads with corporate PAC dollars, the same corporations that come out and celebrate pride and talk about the diversity of America and market to diverse audiences. And they're let's paying just, for this. Let's just put let's just put a finer point on this too. T-Mobile was one of the um, corporate PACs, I think, that said following the, you know, the GOP sedition vote, um, where where a majority of House uh you know, Congress people, Republicans, right, voted against certifying the results along with uh, the election results from 2020 for absolutely no reason, right, completely baseless. Um, and then, of course, eight Republicans also joined with that effort, which eight Senate Republicans, which was just crazy, too. Um, but T-Mobile was, I think, took that one of those pledges of, oh, we're going to stop giving donations for a bit and reevaluate our giving. And then like a month later, they had reevaluated their giving and they were back to giving. Um, and if I remember correctly, and maybe Zach, you can talk about this. I think T-Mobile um, actually uh, it targets, um, you know, as a target market, um, 
uh, Latino uh, consumers. I am I right about that? And at the same time, then they're giving money to the NRSC and the, you know, the NRCC, the, ha the campaign arms of the Senate and the House for, for Republicans. So, you know, it it's like talking out of both sides of your mouth. On the one hand, you're saying, we really want your business and we're formulating ads to like get you to come, you know, use our network. And then on the next, in the next breath, they're like, and we're shoving a bunch of that money that we're getting from you to <laughs> Republicans and they're going to smear you all over the place. Is, am, am I right about that? Yeah, no, it, it, exactly. Um, you know, they've got a whole, T-Mobile has a whole campaign really targeting. They've got T-Mobile Latino that they target on Twitter and have a whole kind of uh, marketing campaign to, to, to reach a diverse audience. And then there's, um, you know, Senator Rick Scott of Florida, who now runs the NRSC, you know, in, in Florida, you know, courting the Latino vote. And then in different ads that he's helping to fund and then cut and run in different states, going around and turning out and targeting those same communities. Now we see those those last two clips, the last ad that we saw on that clip was from the NRSC, the National Republican Senate Committee. Um, and they're doing, like what we see in that ad, right, is, is saying, well, the stimulus check, right? The reason why we can't give you stimuli, we can't give you stimulus, the reason why we can't give you healthcare, the reason why we can't give you better jobs, or, you know, it's because, well, undocumented immigrants would get it then. So, so far, it's their excuse to get to know, which not only hurts that community, but ends up hurting everyone, you know, all of their constituents, you know, as well as the same kind of white voters that they're targeting with those ads. They're turning around and saying that you're not going to get health care. You're not going to get a stimulus check, right? Because, you know, we're not, we're, we're the party of no. Uh, we're the party of saying we're not, we're not going to pass anything forward because we're consumed on this kind of small, narrow block. And I know, you know, there's T-Mobile, but there's also, you know, AT&T as well. And I, and I know for certain that AT&T came out with a statement and said that they were going to suspend those donations to the same, um, you know, uh, the, the same representatives who voted against certification of election, 147 of those, you know, but then we were also, we started to look and say that AT&T gave, you know, $854,000 to those candidates in total. Now, looking at some of the ones that ran dog whistle ads, you know, uh, AT and T gave nearly a half of uh, a billion dollars to candidates who ran racist dog whistle ads in 2020 alone. And so, this the it, money it, is kind of dispersed. You just said you said a, a half a billion dollars. Is that what you said? Oh, sorry, uh, a half a million dollars. Sorry. Half a million. Okay, I was like, Whoa! yeah, sorry, looking at my notes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, looking at my notes, okay. Carol. <laughs> It's still, uh, it's still a lot of money. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, still, it's still a lot of money. And the really, what, what, what's important about that is that they're maxing out at those donations as well, too. You know, they're, they're hitting the $10,000 mark that they can give to these candidates. And really what we've seen, you know, from Mitch McConnell, you know, over these last couple of days is, is, it, is an indication that if corporate America is, is going to not support with their dollars the anti-democratic the um, strategic racism model, that if they pull those dollars, they really have the power to shift what, how Republicans maybe will start to act in the future. Um, you know, we saw a leaked memo from the uh, the CLF, uh, the Cong Congressional Leadership Fund, a, uh, a major uh, party organ of the Republican Party on the House side. They had a leaked memo that said that they got outspent by Democrats everywhere, and they were really concerned about local, can like, candidates being able to raise that sort of money. And if corporations like AT&T and T-Mobile start to pull their donations, those candidates are not you know, on condition of you know, not running racist ads. You know, what we could actually start to see a real shift. And that's good for democracy. That's good for the constituents. And that's good for America overall. Right. And, and just, to, just to be clear, what McConnell is, I mean, McConnell is running scared on this. The idea, I just want everyone to know that Mitch McConnell, who is not a great orator, you know, has the charisma of a slug, you know, he 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 has built his career on winning elections by buying them, by having the most money to run the most ads and, you know, get, I mean, that has been his entire career was forged on how can I get political donations in order to really buy elections one way or the other. Um, and he's been smart about that. And I'll give him credit. But it's not because he has any charisma because he's got zero of it. 
even Obama, Barack Obama didn't want to have drinks with Mitch McConnell, if we remember correctly, right? So, so he was like, you have drinks with Mitch McConnell and tell me how it goes. So anyway, um, <laughs> just a little, little drunk history there. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, <laughs> and now we're moving to the drunk history episode. No, we're not going to. Um, all right. I'm sorry. I'm off on a, I'm off on a lark here, <laughs> but but Mitch McConnell, if he's threatening corporate America, is running scared, is my point. He is he has built his entire career on getting major political donations from corporate America, from wealthy donors, and using that to leverage obtaining power. And power is the sole organizing, you know, concept of his of his life. So it is just almost unimaginable that he's threatening corporations um, just to, you know, be really clear about it. And I'm wondering, you know, Joe and Zach, either one of you can jump in here, but I, I think you have a, um, you know, I'm wondering what we can, what we need to do if, if McConnell is threatening on his side, right? He's threatening, Hey, if you guys don't give money to us, or I mean, if you guys, if you guys, go on record against our policies and stop giving money to us because it's politically unpopular to do that. And let's be clear, Republicans are on the wrong side of where the culture of a, where American culture is moving. And that's the problem for them. Right. He's saying we're going to stop being your lobbyists in Congress. We're going to stop doing everything you want to do, no matter how much it harms American workers, no matter how many people it kills in terms of gun violence and no matter how no matter how what happens you know we were willing to to go to bat for you no matter what and we're going to stop doing that so if mcconnell's threatening that on the one hand you know the culture is moving in a different direction republicans are keenly aware of this and i want to know um how we can make it really clear to these corporations on the other side that we're not going to let this go you know, well, right now it feels like for the first time we are seeing corporate America, the corporate corporations that have funded Republicans are being held accountable for the policies that Republicans are enacting, right? And this is a very important step. And I give so much credit to everybody, Fair Fight and New Georgia Project. I, we mentioned Judd Legum, everyone who's calling this out, every single person who's calling out, it's so important. I think the next step is tying the GOP politics to these corporations, the corporations that are making these ugly ads possible. And it's we, we saw, saw racist and xenophobic ads. There are gonna be a lot of transphobic ads. We saw a lot of really, that's what the Republicans, Stephen Miller has said, this is an issue we're gonna run on. And apparently he said it's a GOP agenda. So it's important to all communities of color, all communities, of uh, the, the LGBTQ community, anybody who cares about basic decency, the same kind of decency that these corporations tell us they care about when in fact they're funding the politics of the GOP. And I think that's something Zach and I intend to spend a lot of time working on. You'll hear a lot more from us. Well, and I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to reveal anything, but you guys, Zach, are you working on some sort of report comp compilation of what we're talking about here that that just may be in the works? Uh, yeah, there, there is there is a report, a report in the work to kind of look at some of the ads that the corporations are funding, the kind of money that's going through, and also the downstream consequences uh, of what we've seen in these ads. You know, I think, you know, the previous segment is, is a pretty good indication that, you know, what, what happens when you kind of allow this strategic racism to be amplified throughout our society over and over again? You know, what we saw in Atlanta Right, we can't necessarily draw an exact one to one, but you know, we saw in one of those ads where a, a candidate was running and you know called it, you know, the Wuhan virus. Like, you, you're putting good money behind that to amplify that, to put that into people's homes, to put that on their Facebook feeds over and over and over again. And corporations, more than anyone, should know that you know, a hundred million dollars in a in a in an advertising campaign, that's effective. And that is what they are funding here. But what what the, what what they are selling here is strategic racism into our society. And so we're going to be looking at that and trying to hold that off and, and cut that spigot off um, because they're they're asking for our dollars to 
come to uh, and spend at their corporations because they know that the younger generation is more diverse, you know, uh, it no longer, you know, is, it, is willing to accept the racism and, you know, that their, that their, you know, futures depend on it. You know what I think for them, they're making the calculation. It's maybe just as bad for business to continue to fund strategic racism as it is to fund, to try to get, you know, corporate tax cuts. Yeah. Right. Thank so you let so me, much. Cause yeah, I, I thank mean, you. <laughs> thank you so much. I tell you what, Kara, I'm going to give you uh, one of the last words here. Uh, I want to thank Zach for joining us. Uh, we, we've come to the end. We're going to run just a little over because that's what Kara and I like to do. Um, so Joe, stick with us. But um, Zach, thank you so much. You're the director of communications for America's voice. Um, we really appreciate your work and you joining us today. Thanks. Glad to be here. So speaking of young activism, changing the paradigm on gun violence, uh, on, on the culture, um, I'm just going to go ahead and give uh, Kara Zelaya a, a chance to weigh in uh, before we say goodbye to our listeners and viewers. Yeah, I mean, I just I wanted to thank Zach and, and Joe and Carrie. Thank you so much for, for having me on uh, the show. Um, and I, I just wanted to encourage anyone who's listening, whether it's young or old, to just remember that the unifying message that we've heard here is that whatever Mitch McConnell or the Republican Party is trying to peddle to you about how like baseball is canceled and that this is a non bipartisan issue, um, anti racism and gun violence prevention are wildly popular issues. And it is a good thing to remember that the American populace is rallying behind those. And as a party, we need to stand stronger and firmer to those convictions. Great. Joe, you got a, you got a, final, a final word? You don't have to, but you can. Well, I just want to thank you. And I, I just want to tell you, I am, you know, I have more gray hair. I'm not one of the younger ones, but I am in awe of the activism of people like Kara, of, Brandon, of Zach, they inspire me every single day. We saw it with the young LGBTQ activists. We saw it with the dreamers. They're, they're gonna make the change in America that we need. And I'm just honored to be even in the same world that they are in. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. We're just at our minute and 30 past the hour, which is where we like to be. Um, I want to say th a special thank you to Joe Sudbay for joining us. Uh, he's, as I said, a very good buddy and friend of mine. And uh, we talk all things politics all the time and have been very good friends for a decade now, over a decade, actually. Um, and Kara Zelaya, our, uh, you know, my my partner in crime on co-hosting when, when Marcos is away. So um, listen, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We appreciate everything you do in your capacity and stay safe out there, wear your masks, get vaccinated. Let's get back to some real life and let's start getting ready for 2022 because Democrats are going to kick some butt. <laughs>